All right, then without any further ado, good evening, good boch, as people come in, and uh, it's happy Hanukkah, it wasn't originally supposed to give a talk of Hanukkah, but as you know, we changed it, we did. I want to start always by thanking Shemri Amunah for being the host, and for the Lehman family for being the series sponsor, and tonight I want to thank, of course, the Glazer family. As you can see over here, this is sponsored by Michael Glazer in honor of his parents, who are sitting right here on the side, Dr. Milton Sandra Glazer, and uh, we hope everybody will survive corona and COVID every, in a healthy way. Everything should just go good. I want to thank the tech team for all the time they put into it. And with any, without any further ado, we'll get right down to work. Okay, the name of the series is um, The Last Years Before Oslo, The State of Israel on Jewish People, 1988 to 1992. Tonight is the sixth lecture, number six, which is entitled Unhealthily Polarized Partisan Polity. Kind of like the alliterations. Um, Israeli politics implied and sorted. 1980-1992. All politics is sublime and assorted, except in Baltimore, Maryland. Here we have a perfect system and everything is run 100% above board. But everywhere else, it's a problem. Okay, here we go. Last year, we talked about Israel after Menachem Begin. Be uh, Begin's political legacy was a two-party system which lasted for about 20 years. Uh, today, as we all know, following the latest news in Israel, there's not even a one-party system. So the history of Israel, if you want to look at it in that partisan terms, has several stages. First, we know that uh, there used to be a one-party system. That's in the period when it had these people, Ben-Gurion, Golda Meir, and so forth. Um, by that I mean there are a lot of parties, but only one party ever got 40 and above, and nobody else even came close. So if you look at the 49 elections, 51, 55, and so forth and so on, you'll see that nobody even came close to 30. And Ben-Gurion and the Mapai, and later when they combined with the Marach, always got in the 40s and 50s, even the 50s. That being the case, there's no question all during these years which is the party that's going to form a government and run the country. The only question was the coalition politics. Will they team up with this party or team up with that party? That's the funny thing. Usually, Israel, as I think everybody knows, has a proportional representation situation, and not like we have in the United States, we have a single member district. The proportional representation means that whatever percentage you got of the total vote, because the whole of Israel is a single district, right? They don't have, like we have in America, different districts. So the entire country is one district. And if somebody got 24% of the vote, whatever the final of the vote is, then you get 24% of the seats in parliament, you know? So just do your calculations. How much is 24% of, of 120, and that kind of thing. Now, um, that's a European system. Many countries in Europe have that. The problem is usually that you end up with a system such as you have at the present time in Israel, which is unusual, which is that, you know, um, the little parties, they're all little, come and go, and they form, and then they can fall real easily. <laughs> so it's profoundly unstable. The French are particularly, and the Italians, are particularly famous for this. There's that old speech of Will Rogers back in the 1920s. I went to England, to London in the morning to see the changing of the guard, and I drove to Paris in the afternoon to see the changing of the government. You understand? Know That's how it used to be. And Israel has not turned out to be that way, which is interesting. It's not the history of Israel. There's a lot of shenanigans with the politics, all the rest of it. But for 30 years, from 1948 to 1977, almost 30 years, as I think everybody here knows, the same party held power, election after election. So it gave Israel quite an interesting stability from that point of view. Maybe it was the right policy that they pursued. Maybe it's the wrong policy. You can debate that. But in other words, the same hands were in charge of the situation for a long time. And that's actually important for the history of Israel, making it a relatively stable country. We forget the very extreme importance of stability, political stability. Right now in the United States, we had some roller coasters in the last couple of years, and we stare at the possibility with horror of instability. You understand? Stability is very, very important. So for 30 years, Israel had more or less a one-party system. And, you know, they had elections and all that, and everybody can vote, and so on and so forth. But the Labor Party, as they call first in Mapai, then under different names, always got much larger than anybody else. And so it was just a question of who they're going to team up with. You understand? Is Ben-Gurion going to team up with the Religious Party? Is he going to team up with the Mapai Party? With the, uh, you know, this one, this one? But it's always a question of who you're going to team up with. That's a matter of horse trading, and that's what politics is. That's what politics is. Um, this was eventually replaced by a two-party system. That's when Begin came in, okay? So for about 30 years or so, um, you had 
situation where, and that's what we're talking about tonight. We're covering the years, hopefully, of 88 to 92. That's in the middle of the second era of Israeli politics, in which you really had two big parties, uh, Labor and uh, Likud. Right? So, for example, in the 84 elections I talked about last year, one party got 44, I think, and the other one got 41. That's between, out of 120, two parties have nearly three quarters of the whole business. You understand? Now, it's not good, it's not bad, but it's, it, but it's, it's interesting, okay? He had a two party system. Um, then it went back to one party system until recently because the labor lost confidence of the public broadly after the Arab terrorism. This is after Barack. And when Sharon came in, maybe we forget this now. I hope you forget it, because then I'll be able to talk about his past history. That, uh, when Sharon came in, the public in general wasn't going to give the Labour Party much votes. And every government since then has been in the Likud. Right? So it's been Sharon and then Bibi, basically, with a small interlude. But basically, that's the general trend, because the public, Yemeni, is more to the right on the, on the issues of national security. Uh, today, this has collapsed. You and I are quite aware of this. Maybe it has to do with the corona, maybe it has to do with BB, maybe it has a corruption, could be a lot of reasons. But the system that was until now, which is that BB is going to be a prime minister, Nachamal, 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 just a question of you know, musical chairs of how they switch around with the other parties, uh, which has been the case all during Obama and all during Trump, uh, is now we're in a new ball game. And today, there's not even a single party in charge, as you know. It could unravel all the time because a bunch of small parties. And the very fact that Naftali Bennett, who, what is he, have four, is it four votes or something like that? Six, six okay, I mean, you know, somebody with six votes can be the prime minister is unthinkable in the old days, okay? Now, so our story takes place tonight during the era of the two-party system. The 94 elections, as I said before, left a balance with Labor of 44 and Likud of 41, which is almost the same. And that means out of 126, 85, which is a very large percentage, it's almost three quarters, was in the two parties. That's basically that's a sign of a stability. Uh, in America, we like to think that we have a good idea with a two-party system. In England, they more or less have a two-party system, basically. That's usually the most stable of the situations. Okay. Now, um, the other parties, as you can see on this chart, I forgot my pointer, got very small numbers. If you're able to read the numbers. At the top, it's 44 and 41, and then we got 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Little. Nobody comes close to 40, you see? And so it was a funny kind of situation. They got peanuts. As you can see by the numbers, this created a weird situation. Because let's say I'm uh, Shimon Paris, and I won 44 seats. Okay, so what do I do now? Am I going to cobble together a government by going one here, one there, two here, three here, two here, two here? And each guy has to get a cabinet ministry, and the religious parties are going to squeeze this way, and the anti-religious parties, because some of them are anti-religious, are going to squeeze that way. And it's going to be weird. It, it's offensive that such a tiny party, which represents such a small percentage of the population, should exert so much power. It can happen, and it does, but it's just offensive. This is what led to the two parties teaming up. Get it? The two parties, they said, listen, between the two of us, we certainly represent the vast majority of the voters, which is true. Like I said before, between the two parties, there's a 70% or more of the electorate. So we should team up together, although that was most unusual. And uh, that's what we dealt with last year. Okay. Uh, and uh, this led to the coalition government of, of 1984 to 1988 that I tried to talk about last year. Now, one of the interesting features that's happening in this election and next election, is the disintegration of some of the traditional religious parties, which is kind of cool. Because tonight we're doing like stand the fan, we're talking politics the way people talk about it, sports, you know. <laughs> so this is the Israeli Knesset politics. And for years and years, the religious parties was a pretty much predictable situation. There was the Mizrahi party, the Maftal, the NRP as they call it, National Religious Party, and they always got around 12. Sometimes a little bit less, yeah, always got around 12. And the Aguda, in its various iterations, the Aguda, Poli Aguda, always got around six. You know, sometimes a little less. I don't think they ever went over six, and I don't think the Mizrahi ever went over 12. So that's what you're talking about. So basically, in electoral terms, the religious parties represented 15% of the population. 
Correct? I mean, you know, if it's uh, 120 and you're talking about 18 seats altogether, so it's a 15%. All right. You know, it's a chalik. Very far from being the majority. And the labor parties, the other parties, used to deal with them in those terms. Now, democracy has a way of saying like this. Just because something is in there for a long time doesn't mean new and young people might come up and say, I don't like the system, I'm going to change the system. And a whole bunch of different reasons can pop up. And new political realities emerge. As they gave us. And so, the result is that uh, the National Religious Party was on its way to oblivion. We know this today. Basically, it hardly exists. Uh, the old Mizrahi of our parents' generation, some people say our grandparents' generation, in which you knew these people were, and they had a certain profile. And like I said, they always represent 12% of, uh, uh, of, the, of 12 of the seats, not just 10% of the vote. It was a stable, predictable thing. That whole world went out and was succeeded by Shas which is a very different type of party. And in the 80s that we're talking about, in the 84 and 88 elections that I'm about to speak about, the Mizrahi party's on the way down and the Shas party's on the way up. That is how the cookie crumbled. It's interesting that since 1984, which we're talking almost 40 years now, almost, um, the Kippah through God world has not been able to put Humpty Dumpty together again. Right? To have a single party in Eretz Yisrael, which represents a right, a center, and a left of the people who will say like this, what we have in common is more important than what we don't have in common. And what we have in common is we all belong to a Dati Lumi kind of outlook and you know, religious Zionists and all those sense of the word. Uh, some of us are a little this way, some of us are a little that way. That notion that we're all in one big tent and therefore we should vote that way hasn't been able to be re resurrected. It's just interesting. <clears throat> As for the Haredim, the ultra-Orthodox parties, the United Front, also in the 80s, of the Hasidim and the Misnagdim, because that's what the Aguda party was. Ever since 1912, the Aguda is an attempt, an attempt to unite the Hasidim on the one end and the non-Hasidim on the other. Uh, back in Europe, it was the Litvaks and the Yekes, okay? Uh, you know, like the Hersheyan types uh, with the Hasidim. So when the head state of Israel started in 1948, so the Agudat Israel party was, you know, an attempt to combine the votes. Because after all, they'll say like this, what, what, what we have in common is more important than what we have difference. If you go that route, that also was a broke apart um, for reasons that I talked about and we'll talk about again. So it fractured the small vote into smaller parties. Again, the Haredim haven't really put Humpty Dumpty together again. Although today they have reunited I forget what they call it, the uh, United Torah or something like that. Uh, theoretically, theoretically, there are a lot of Haredim living in Israel. All the numbers grow all the time. So by my calculation, the Agoda type party should get like 15 seats. Uh, but instead they get seven. So there's something interesting going on there. You know what I'm saying? Uh, now I can guarantee you, I was just talking with Ravi Oberstein about this, that maybe you saw this in the paper, they all went to see the Minister of Communications the other day complaining about the cell phones, the smartphones, and uh, he didn't give, because they want the government to you know, enable them to ban the smartphones for the Haredim, and the guy wasn't playing ball with them because they're not part of the government anymore, and they don't have the power that they once had. And this was a pretty ruthless business. If this would be a couple years ago under the BB government, if they would ask the government to help them with the cell phones, they would do it, because they need their votes. This is how it works over there in Israel. Let's just get used to it. Okay, um, so as I say, we're doing insider baseball today. Anyway, the coalition government between the labor and the coup lasted, to everyone's surprise, for four years. Right? It, it, it went all the way. This produced pluses as well as minuses. The pluses, and I'm talking about major pluses, were first of all the inflation. We talked about it last year. In simple terms, they cut down the inflation. Because you had two parties working together instead of one trying to undermine the other, and sabotaging whatever one does, the other one sabotages. So because of that, um, they cut the inflation from 350% to like 20%. Now 20% is far from perfect, but that's amazing, okay? And that's something that Paris and these other guys did in the mid 80s I talked about last year. So that was one big positive result, the fact you had a coalition government. The second big positive result had to do with Israel's Vietnam, or as we call it, Lebanon. They were stuck in there, they didn't know what to do, they, you know, waging a low-level asymmetric war. 
to use our terms, body bags were coming back all the time. They had no way to stop the Hezbollah business. They didn't know. And as you know, eventually, in the long, long run, much years later, they just got all the heck out of there. Not that that solved the problem, but it solved the immediate problem. Okay? And it would have been a nightmare for Israel internally had one party said, we should do this in Lebanon, another one said, do that in Lebanon. A is trying to sabotage B, and B is trying to sabotage A. But never, on the, however, in the years I'm talking about, in the mid-'80s, and even afterwards, the two parties were in the same government, the coalition government. Yitzhak Rabin was the Minister of Defense, and he was respected by both sides. And therefore, Israel, I would say, like it's made the best of a bad situation. You get it? In other words, whatever they did, at least everybody was on board. And that was important also. Thirdly, you had the Intifada, which I didn't get around to. I hope to talk about it now, which broke out in 87. And that was a bad news. And it would have been much worse if you have one government, one party in government, one party opposing them, and one's trying to sabotage what the other one's doing. Once again, Israel certainly made its share of mistakes, but they got some things right as well. And whatever it is, the fact that they had a unified government was a big plus as far as Israel is concerned. And finally, what we talked about last week, the Ethiopian Jewry, which they did do during these years in the 80s and the early 90s, like I tried to explain uh, last week, had to do a lot with the fact that you had a united government in Israel, and they could at least, you know, agree on some things and get it done. Okay? Now, there were minuses as well of having two parties in the government. The big minus is what I call TSS, the two-state solution. Okay? Uh, the labor was in favor of sending up a Palestinian state of some kind or another on the West Bank and the Gaza Strip. As we know, the Likud was totally opposed to that. During the four years of 84 to 88, A sabotaged B and B sabotaged A. Okay? Each one tried to block what the other one was doing. This is the history of Israel during the second Ronald Reagan administration because uh, Shimon Peres, when he held this position and that position, was pushing all the time to figure out some way because he saw that as the Yeshua and the, and, the, and, and the final solution for Israel's national security problems. I repeat, he saw the withdrawal of the Israeli army. I know it sounds funny. He says it was the, Israel, the Israeli army from the West Bank and from Gaza as the final solution in a positive way of Israel's security problem. We won't have any terrorism anymore. That's how he saw it. And of course, Shamir and these other guys saw the exact opposite. Okay? So uh, you have a stalemate because neither one was able to knock out the other. And stalemates are very bad in, in the military wars, agreed? The worst thing in a war is a stalemate, like World War I, because then the casualties just pile up. You get it? War is bad, but at least in one war, A beats B, and then it's over. Or conversely, B beats A, and then it's over. It's not good, but then it's over. If it's a stalemate, it goes on and on and on, like happened in 1914 and 1918, and in many other situations as well. So stalemate is like the worst. And... Uh, in political wars, it's very bad because you know, it just gets worse and worse and neither can force the other. Since Shamir and the Likud could block a two-state solution, Paris, who was frustrated and was anyway, um, they call Israel, Big East, which we would say an inveterate behind-the-scenes intriguer, that's who he was. Listen, that's how he got the weapons from France and the A-bomb and all that stuff. That's, that's his nature. So since he's an intriguer, um, so he went to the powerful American Jews who are liberal. I'm talking about the big machers in the federations and the American Jewish establishment. And they were totally in favor by this time of the two-state solution as part of the political correctness. And to go behind the back of Shamir and somehow or other, either using Edgar Bronfman and people like that, or the Reagan administration itself, maybe George Shultz, whatever, to try to uh, force Israel into a two-state solution. So in other words, a member of the Israeli government used to go outside the government, either to America or to other powerful people, maybe it was the British or the Europeans, and say, do me a favor, squeeze my country. <laughs> you understand? Which is uh, uh, quite amazing. Okay? Now, the Intifada, as I said before, which was the uprising going on in the West Bank and the Gaza, was a bleeding ulcer on the body politic, obviously, which is just what Arafat wanted, because Arafat hoped that the Intifada, which he didn't start, but he wanted to take advantage of and blame him, would lead to a two-state solution, would lead to a Palestinian state, which, of course, to him, as I think we know today, a two-state solution was the first stage 
in wiping out Israel. Okay? But, you know, what do you say? Hindsight? Now, the truth of the matter is, you didn't have to have hindsight. I thought this already 30 years I remember, though, you couldn't convince certain types of people any other way. And my own show anywhere else. We couldn't convince them. Now, Arafat was um, successful, therefore, in getting the Israeli left on the Labor Party, which is big, to see the two-state solution as a solution to the Intifada. If you will set up a Palestinian state of some kind or another, it's just a question of what kind of arrangement should be part of Jordan, not part of Jordan, this, that, and the other, uh, then that will bring an end to the Intifada. But Arafat was not able to get the Likud uh, to see it that way, not with people like Shamir and Moshe Aarons and Simbel guys in charge. Remember, at the years we're talking about, Menachem Begin was still alive. <laughs> okay? And the people in the Likud said, this is like a Hitler, and it was. I'm talking about Arafat. This was the situation when the time came for new elections in 1988. Between Labor and Likud, Labor had an uphill battle. Um, why? Because what Paris wanted was the equivalent of a mandate for a two-state solution. In other words, to get something like this done, it's a major move to get the Israeli army to pull out. Now, these are major changes. In a democracy, and this is something probably we have in America today, if you have a slim majority trying to shove it down the throat of the large minority, it makes things very bitter. It's not a healthy way to go. Now, this is exactly what has poisoned American politics in the last 20 years or so. When the left is in charge, they sh try to shove it down so the right. When the right is in charge, they shove it down the left. This is what it is. There's no attempt to gain some kind of a consensus. You understand? And, you know, literally, by the rules, it's true. If I have 61, you have 59, I win. It's not healthy. And uh, this is not this year, but, you know, in Israel, it got so unhealthy that they shot Rabin, which is a, which is a you know, manifestation of the unhealthy nature of pushing things you know, in, in, when a lot of people don't want it. Um, I think we have a lot of PC stuff like in America this way. It's just people don't like it. You see? One of the things we're afraid of now is, is the anti-vaxxer movement getting very big of this kind of nature. You understand? A democracy calls for certain types of politics. You understand? And you, you, you simply have to understand that. So if you're Shim in Paris, you say, yes, well, if I could get like 50, 60 votes, and have at least half the country or more on my side, then the minority cannot say anything if I implement a withdrawal of Israeli army from the West Bank and from the Gaza and all the rest of it. But if I don't, then it's more tricky. So he really wanted to get a big number, but how are you going to do that? Okay? How was the parliamentary arithmetic supposed to work out? I mean, he wasn't really going to win 61 seats. Nobody in Israel has ever won 61 seats. 61 gives you total control, as you know. You have 51%. So it always comes down to the smaller parties joining a labor-led coalition. And that's always very complicated, right? Here was the old system where, you know, as you see, uh, the labor had 44 seats. What are you going to put together? You know, three and three and two and this and that and the other. So let's say you have 45 seats. I need at least 16. So I have to make a deal with this party, make a deal with this party. And to tell you the truth, the little parties are, are different. Some are on the right and some are on the left. And if you squeeze something through with 61, and then you say, yes, we're going to take such a big decision as evacuating Eretz Yisrael, evacuating all the Mitnachlim and all the rest of it, the way Sharon later on did, as you know, in the Gaza, right? Um, you're going to tear the country apart. It would have come down to these smaller parties. In addition, in the Israeli system, the president of Israel, at that time was Chaim Herzog, who's supposed to be nonpartisan, by tradition, asked the party with the highest number of seats to take the first crack at assembling a coalition. In other words, the first crack at bribing the smaller parties. So whoever the president of Israel says, you go first, is the one officially who has the power, you know, backroom deals to say like this, you join my coalition, this is what you get. Okay? This is what you get. So um, it's an advantage. So basically, the point was like this. The trick, at least, is to get more than anyone else. Even if you get, if I get 31, you get 30, at least. If I get 21, you get 20. At least I got the most, and I get the first pick. Right? This is the Israeli system. It's a European system. We're not used to this in the United States. We have a very different system and all the rest of it. It's a proportional representation, 
representation parliamentary system in which the president of the country, and sometimes the king in, in, in some of these monarchies in Europe, they, they uh, talk to all the parties. That's the process. You have to physically uh, consult with all the parties. I mean, even the Communist Party, you know what I'm saying? Even if you're party in one seat, and then the president says, having, he's supposed to be a nonpartisan above the fray, having spoken with all the parties, the way I see it, um, transparently, I would ask this party to take the first crack. You see? So that's how the Israeli system works. In Israeli, Israeli electoral history, every election has certain quirks. If you know the nitty gritty of the Israeli political parliamentary election history. For example, in 1988, which is what we're looking at this year, um, one of the quirks was the fact that Mayor Kahana's party, Rabbi Kahana's party, Kach, was declared illegal, was banned. So in other words, they were denied the democratic ability to appeal to the voters. Okay? This is a very interesting aspect of the Israeli democratic system. Again, I'm not talking about the United States. We have a different system, which started in the Ben-Gurion era when the Arabs in the, in, in the late 50s, early 60s, some young Arabs started something called al Adr, al Adrs, right? Which means the land. And uh, it's in Ben-Gurion time when some young Arabs who didn't like the Ben-Gurion system, and remember the, Jews were, the Arabs were under a military government, and um, they were against Israel, plain and simple. It's only 10 years after the establishment of the state. They're like for Nasser, you know? And they said, we want to start a party which is against Israel. There's a democracy, right? And we think this is all wrong. We want Israel to go out of business. Uh, we're not fooling around. This is, you know, this is our right to advocate for that. And at that time, the, uh, Israel has the ele Central Elections Board. And they said, um, anybody is using democracy to go against Israel, you can't run. So they took it to the Supreme Court. And he says, it's not fair, it's a democratic country. If the, no, I mean, for argument's sake. Suppose I run and say Israel should go out of business. Let's just argue and sake. And suppose I get 85% of the electorate. What, what do you have to say? Then you're illegitimate. Do you, you know what I'm saying? In other words, let the people speak. That's the idea. Nevertheless, uh, the Israeli Supreme Court at that time was a different thing. They, um, well, let me rephrase that. The Central Elections Board took upon themselves to say, that's a misuse of democracy. Um, the rules of the game are you have to be, you can advocate whatever you want as long as it's within Israel as a Jewish state. They took it to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court, two to one, supported the Central Elections Board in banning them. Like two said like this, you know, that, that this is a misuse of democracy and they cannot run. There was no CNN at that time and all the rest of it, so they got away with it. They won judge when the Israeli Supreme Chaim Kohn, famous controversial guy, he said, he said, listen, he took a very legalistic point of view. There are lawyers here in the audience. There's no law in the books that gives the Central Elections Board the right to ban a party. You want to pass a law? Pass a law, which they didn't. In spite of what I said, since it was two to one, they got away with it, okay? So now here comes Kahana, who basically it's not saying I want to overthrow it, but I think he would say, I want to get rid of Israeli democracy and bring in a theocracy. I mean, that's one of his themes. And I certainly want to kick out all the Arabs. I want to kick out all the Arabs. That's a big part of the population. And I'm doing it democratically. <laughs> so this raises the very interesting question, what is democracy? And I've raised it here from time to time. I mean, from a strictly theoretical perspective, is this democratic? I'm running on a ticket that says, if I get 51%, I'm going to shoot the other 49%. After all, a majority will support my program. Is that what democracy is? Does it give legitimacy to anything at all as long as it's done by a majority? These are fair questions to have in a, uh, I guess, in a poli-sci uh, seminar. Okay, then you, all of a sudden you gotta pull out your old books of political philosophy and things like that. It's a good question, you understand? So uh, at that time they said, in Israel, the, as I said, the, the, the opinion was like this. There are limits beyond which even we don't agree with. You understand? And uh, this is the limits. You, got, you can have a democracy, you can say what you want, you can advocate for anything within certain limits. The limits are wide, but you can't say you want to get rid of Israel. Okay? I was looking, I can't find the picture that I wanted to share, but I know it's there somewhere. If you look, Goebbels, 
the propaganda minister for Hitler, visited Czechoslovakia to sedate in Germany sometimes in the 1930s. And he gave a speech there, and he said, one day we're going to win democratically, and then we're going to wipe out Czechoslovakia. There's nothing you can do about it, because you're democratic. You believe in the right to free speech. So how exactly does that work? Now, I don't have constitutional professors here in the audience, I don't think. But it'd be an interesting question. This couldn't happen in America, I don't believe. You couldn't ban a party. The Nazi party, I'm sure, runs somebody for president. Now, it is true that they're so marginal that you can afford to be you know, as uh, liberal as you wish. But um, you, know, you understand me, American freedom of speech is usually based on the marginality of the extreme positions. Although it's tricky, I always like to point out, and I'm sure I have when I was young, and when some of you were young, there was a pretty effective system in this country of a kind of restriction of free speech, even though it wasn't really there. And what I mean to say is as follows. Long ago, before the internet, remember such an era? <laughs> Does anybody remember such an era before the internet? You had something called the television. And the television had a limited number of stations, and they had to be federally licensed. It goes back to FDR and all those laws they passed in the 30s, the Federal Communications Act. And therefore, basically like this, if you're advocating for Nazi, I'm not giving you a license. Now, I'm not taking away your constitutional right to say whatever you want. You can stand on any street corner and advocate for whatever you want, but you don't have the right to airwaves. And same thing for the radio, you see? And just by doing that, you and I grew up in a safer America because it is true as Newton Minow said back in 1963, that television is a vast wasteland. But you didn't get anti-Semitism, other kinds of racism, extreme views, and things like that. Okay? Maybe you got Mickey Mouse and Hattie Judy, but you didn't get, you didn't get, you know, uh, uh, things which in another country you might get and would upset the whole balance. What did the what did the Roosevelt administration do to Father Coughlin at the end, back in the 1930s, the famous radio preacher who was causing all the trouble? You can't take away his right to speech, right? So what they said was like this, we're pulling his radio license. And the postmaster general said this, I'm not delivering his, his magazine. I don't have to do that. It's not a constitutional right to get, to get your postage done. If you can deliver yourself, give them to hate. We're talking in the 30s where well, you couldn't do that. And so you can stand in your church and say whatever you want, and anybody who wants to come here can't hear you. But we're not to give you the public airways and the public uh, space. I, I'm just, you know, the reason I mention this is this has all been undermined by the internet. You see? And we, we have unregulated internet, which theoretically sounds good, but it's actually not good. Not for us. Not for us. Okay? Because mar you know, opinions that were once upon a time marginalized are now mainstream. And as you know, plenty of people get their news and all their beliefs straight from you know, this line or that line. It's, it's a problematic. On the other hand, the main line news sources are so biased in their way that nobody wants to listen to them either. So we live in a messy world. Now we switch back to Israel, and you see that they have a policy of saying there are certain limits beyond which you can't go. Um, now, that's the history of Israel. When Kahana came in, he ran in, he moved to Israel, I don't remember when, around 1980, something like that, I believe. And uh, he ran in 84, and he got a seat or two. And when he was going to run next time, it looked like he was going to get a lot more, because he had access to public airwaves, and he said like this, you know, you put me in charge, I'll, I'll fix this intifada, you know, and it just appeals to a certain type of voter. And so the Israeli political establishment freaked out and went into a deep panic, and the elections board um, banned him. Actually, they banned him in 84, but the Supreme Court didn't back it. That's how he ran. The Supreme Court said what Khan Kuhn said back in 1965, pass a law. And so they passed a law in the mid-'80s. And the law indeed says, uh, a, a list of candidates cannot run for the election in the Knesset. If it contains in its platform explicitly or implicitly one of the following three objectionable things. Number one, denial of Israel as a Jewish state. So if you advocate for the end of Israel as a Jewish state. Number two, democratic if you reject the democratic character of the state, so that'd be Kahana, you understand? You say, again, when I come in, I'm gonna, I'm gonna create a dictatorship. So then we won't let you run. And three, 
how Sassoli gives an uh, agitation to racism, which is a, a tricky term, but never really did it. Notice they put in a law. It's just an interesting part of Israeli history. And um, they used that in 88 to ban him. Okay? So he couldn't run. Uh, some, uh, you know, like that. Now, um, the problem is, what about the other side? There were extreme Arab parties. Uh, that's interesting. They banned them, but the Supreme Court overthrew the ban. Okay? So in 1988, part, uh, Khan's party in the extreme right was banned. But when the election board did this to an extreme leftist anti-Israel party called the Progressive Lifts for Peace, the Supreme Court overruled the ruling, overturned the ruling and allowed the party to run an election, which really got the Kahana types angry because it knows what well, sauce for the goose and sauce for the gander. How come it's not? How come this is okay and this is not okay? Which of course tells you a lot about Israel's civil culture. You know what I'm saying? In other words, d d let me put it this way: they're willing to tolerate, or at least historically, they're willing to tolerate things on the hard left, not willing to tolerate things on the hard right. That's a very liberal kind of position. You understand? Um, it was just interesting. You understand? Now, what is this different? Uh, and of course, the Likud and the other parties actually were secretly happy at disbanding, right? Because if Kahana can't run where his road is going to go. You know, to my party. So this is how they did it. Now, elections, Israeli elections, not surprisingly, usually revolve around the issues, as in many countries, of national security and the economy. Makes sense. Uh, now, I already explained the differences between the national security. The Labor Party was in favor of a two-state solution, and the Likud was not. And that's a big difference. Um, during the campaign, you can be sure that the Likud commercials scored and attacked Paris for intriguing with the U.S. State Department and others, which is a kind of a treason, and portraying him as a kind of a tricky dick, you know. As opposed to Begin, when he was the leader of opposition, he never did this. When Nachum Begin went out of the country, he said like this, I'm not speaking against my government overseas. When I'm in Israel, I can oppose them all I want. But overseas, I have to be a patriot. And he had Paris doing the exact opposite. That was a theme of a lot of the commercials. Um, as for the economy, it was true that the inflation had been brought under control, which was a major achievement, but inflation was still at double digits. Okay? So in other words, you know, the Jewish... Uh, look at this. Look at 1985. 304%, 84, 373%. The inflation was crazy. Some of it, I remember, I remember that. I remember that. Uh, they had indexing. Now look at 1989, it was 20%. 1988, 16 So in other words, it was tremendous. You can't do away with the amazing achievement that it was, but they certainly didn't get there. Now, now it's very low. At least under BB it was low. I don't know whether it's at the moment, it's pretty low. Um, which is why Israel had the startup nation. But at that time, the economy was, the inflation was still high, and that was one of the issues, because what's causing the inflation from not, you know, going down? The Labor Party blamed it on the Likud, spending money on the Shtachim, you know, on the settlements and things in the Gaza Strip and Jewish settlements in the West Bank, and you're buying, you're building them fancy houses and spending so much money on the, what do you call it, the security zone, you know, the defenses and all the rest of it. And you're drain, it's draining the money that we really should use in Israel proper for the economy. It's an argument. The Likud, on the other hand, said the real cause of inflation is the Labor Party, still socialists, are subsidizing the non-efficient kibbutzim and the old boy networks and the histadrut and all the rest of it. Everybody's getting a fat paycheck, you know, like we say today, giveaways. And that's what it's telling you. It's a classic democracy, machlokas, you know, between two sides. You could see that. All right? Now, um, as for the religious voters, as I told you, um, the Agud at that time, this had to do with Rav Shach, split between the Hasidim and the Misnagdim, basically. Uh, this is when they started Degel HaTorah for the Misnagdim, for the non Hasidic. And now the Sephardim had their own party, which is the Shas. So basically, what is the Haredi policy when it comes to voting? You should support the Gedolim. Well, which Gadol? You know? In other words, if I'm Sephardi, that's where I'm going. What about the other guy? It's not my Gedolim. If you're a Litvak, you know, well, then it's a shock. What's there to talk about? What about the other two? Eh. If you're a Chassid, it's the Ger Rebbe. You see? So when you have a situation of choose your Godel, you have no Godel. No, they don't have the kind of, of charisma that can bring in a large number under one banner. It's just, it's just interesting, okay? This is when the Shas 
finally got its legs. And I'm going to show you now. A, it's still primitive. You'll see what I mean by the standards. You and I are Americans. We're, we're used to sophisticated TV commercials, especially nowadays with the internet and all that kind of stuff. But the Shas party is uh, making a, a, a pledge, a plea uh, for votes uh, using Avadi Yosef, who uh, it's all in Hebrew, of course, but you know, he's not saying anything controversial, but the idea is like this. If you're a Sephardi, go for the Shas. Look at this. Blown show. <laughs> He's a connection member. אני פונה בזה בקריאה קדושה אל החן ובית ישראל, אוהבי התורה ושוחרי תושייה. אתם יודעים את אשר השגנו ברוך השם במשך ארבע שנות קיומה של תנועת ש"ס, בהגדלת התורה, בהרבצת התורה, בבניין ובשיפוץ מקוואות טהרה בכל רחבי הארץ, אל המעיין שהרביץ התורה לנוער ולמבוגרים על ידי שיעורי תורה. אתם יודעים את כל הדברים האלה, אחים יקרים, שתתנו את כל עתיכם לתנועת ש"ס, כדי שנוכל לעשות עוד כהנה וכהנה, ביתר שאת וביתר עוז, ולהשפיע כל אחד ואחד על קרוביו, מכריו, ידידיו, אוהביו, כדי שיתנו את כל עתיכם לש"ס. וכל העושים כן, יתברכו בכל הברכות שבתורה, וכל אשר יפנו ישכילו ויצליחו. בעזרת השם יזכו לאורך ימים ושנות חיים, עושר וכבוד וכל טוב. כי דרכיה דרכי נועם וכל נתיבותיה שלום. אנא, תיתנו לנו קולותיכם להחזיר עטרה ליושנה. Oops, we went from four to six. Now, Arafat, who's looking at the election, he encouraged all the voters to vote for Labor because they said they'll vote for him, okay? So you have, you know, Arafat in 1988, and uh, this is going to lead, obviously, to mixed results among the Israeli voters. If you're kind of a leftist type anywhere, liberal, you say, listen, the leader of the other side is saying you vote for Labor, we'll be able to work out a uh, utopian peace, okay? If you're a Likud, guy who said, that Khaleria, he's lying to the teeth, that's exactly why I'm going to vote for the other guy. As always, some horrific terrorist attack, this happens in every election, benefited Likud in the right. This is quite a story. You see, Shimon Peres has set up a sophisticated political message operation to appeal to the voters. Ordinarily, such a professional operation using all the media and door-to-door -door should have garnered a lot of votes because Paris was a professional guy. That's who he was. But fate intervened on the day before the election when we had the famous and terrible incident, the Jericho bus bombing, which was a Palestinian terrorist attack that occurred during the first intifada, in other words, era of the elections in 88, outside the West Bank town of Jericho. In the attack, a bus was targeted by militants wielding Molotov cocktails, and destroyed. It resulted in the death of five Israelis and the wounding of five others. Two perpetrators were arrested immediately in prison by Israel. They were released after 25 years as part of the negotiations you know, when they give back prisoners. Although you see in a second, it's not so posh. On October 30, 1988, so the election is, I believe, November 1, 88. So October 30, 88, two Palestinian youths from the same extended family, Mahmoud Salim Suleiman and Abu Karish, of Jericho and Jumim, wherever, uh, were playing a game of cards at a cafe when one suggested to the other, let's do another Molotov cocktail. In other words, there being no further order of business, I move, let's bomb a bus. The youth had been jailed previously for attempting firebombing. Later that evening, Egged bus number 961, connecting Tiberias and Jerusalem, went through the Jordan Valley, making its way 
on Highway 90 with 22 passengers aboard. I've been on that bus. Have you ever been on that bus? When you're coming back to your line from the north, you go down the um, Jordan Valley, and then you turn back. I, I think, I would imagine a fair number of people here have been on that route. You know, they sh you pass by Jericho. I mean, you know. Uh, later that evening, so the bus was going over there. Among the passengers on the bus was Rebel Yezer, Mordecai Weiss, and 26-year-old 20 year, year wife, Rachel, second grade teacher in Tiberi, and their sons, Netanel, uh, Rafal, and Ephraim, uh, who were on their way to a family affair in Jerusalem. Rachel was a 10th generation Yerushalmi, one of 18 children born to Rabbi Zilberman, founder at Del Many of you have heard of Silbermans, that different way of doing the Chinuch. They do, you know, uh, that whole system. They have schools in the old city. Uh, you know, uh, Ben Chamesh Lemikra and Ben uh, Eser Le Mishnah and so forth. It's a, it's a different, you know, it's a different system. So um, they originally, so she was one of 18 children, the same mother. Um, they originally, I've been in their house. I mean, you know, one of my trips, I forget who arranged it. We had Shal Shudas over there. I mean, they're not 18 anymore in the family, you know, and, and you got to walk through the Arab parts, but there they are. You know, they're one of those houses in the Arab part of the old city, which is protected by Israel. That's what it is. Anyway, the original was sitting together in front of the bus, but Rachel and children moved to the back in order not to her, her, disturb her husband who was learning. An Israeli military jeep passed by was not targeted. As the bus approached Jericho, the attackers jumped out of Banana Grove and forced the bus to slow down. Then they threw three Molotov cocktails. It's a civilian bus setting the bus alight. Most of the passengers reacted quickly and were able to escape the burning bus unharmed. But as the flames began to spread inside the bus, Rachel Weiss went into shock. She threw herself on the kids in a vain attempt to keep them alive. It's a horrible situation. The idea of Corporal uh, David De La Rosa, a passenger exited the bus, noticed that she was sitting in the back door. So he was already out of the bus, and he begged her to come on out, but she refused. In other words, basically, she said, I guess, save yourself. It's too late to save the kids. That's what was going on. And she wouldn't do it, which is, you can understand it. When he tried to pull her out, he heard her say, Shema Yisrael, and he understood that she wanted to remain with her kids. She perished along with her three children, and the guy who tried to save her, De La Rosa, died from burns and smoke inhalation. He was a good citizen, but you, you understand what the, I mean, we all understand what burns and smoke inhalation is. Among the wounded were this one, this one, this one, who made Aliyah from nine years earlier. Let's go on. Weiss and her sons were buried the following day at Haris Hasan. Um, the Israeli settlement of Rachelim, get a Rachel, you know, was named after her. Israel responded swiftly to the attack, clamping a curfew in Jericho, rounding up suspects. By the end of the day, two Palestinians had confessed to, to engineering the attack. One was immediately arrested, the other was taken into custody a little bit later. Their houses were demolished by the security forces. Before dawn the next day, bulldozers began ripping out the banana groves, orange and olive that they used for cover, and hundreds of trees have been uprooted, which is why when I drove by in the bus, I never saw anything like this, because they've changed the whole you know, area. Uh, the attack, which occurred one day before the Israeli elections, and Shimon Peres like this, why <laughs> you have to do that to me? Uh, to the 12th Israeli Knesset, galvanized Israelis influencing their voting, the result was the re-election of a light right wing Likud party coalition, which we'll see got one vote ahead. One vote ahead. Um, I don't think there's any question if they got one vote ahead. Had not been this, then the labor would be one vote ahead. So you can't control. Just as an aftermath, in December 2013, Israel released one of these guys from jail along with 77 others whose crimes were committed prior to Oslo Accords as part of a deal with negotiations between Israel and Palestinian National Authority. In other words, this occurred under Obama, okay? And Adam was in the last batch of prisoners to be released. Then Israel reneged at the last minute, saying that the Palestinians did not live up their commitments under the framework, and they, and they remained in Israeli prisons. And that's why I said before, they didn't really get out. I don't know if you remember this. And the Hamas, ever since then, I imagine you notice, has been trying to capture some live Israelis to use you know, as, as a bargaining chip. If you remember the latest war or two, I'm sorry to be able to talk in those terms, that they had in Gaza, one of the big objectives of the Arabs was what? Was the Hamas, catch, catch a live Israeli. Remember they had to pull a guy out of the tunnels and all this kind of stuff, because they wanted to get these guys out. This was the guy blew up a bus and doesn't regret it. So all I'm trying to say is this is beyond anybody's control. This pushed enough voters to go for Likud that the party beat Paris by a nose to Paris's exquisite torture. Look at the numbers. 
because of this attack, they could get 40 and labor up for 39. Right? And yet Hashem pairs go to the Okay, so in other words, let's put it this way. Their Bani Shalom was not on his side. <laughs> now, um, uh, this is a, you know, quite a, a, a remarkable, you know, kind of a, a, of a event. The real winners were the Haredim, who more than doubled their traditional 6 to 13. So in other words, you still end up with about 18 seats, but within the, of the, all the religious parties, but within that, now it's a black hat versus the Kippah Ruga. You get majority, that's it. Because of, of Adi Yosef and everything we just saw before. Okay? Now most interesting here, and I'm sharing this really insider baseball business because it's going to be of great significance before I'm done tonight. What most interesting at all was the fact that the Aguda, which never got more than four seats, this time got five. Now why did they get the fifth seat? Where you know, did the extra votes come from? The answer is the Labavitch Rebbe, for the first time, told his Hasidim in Israel, vote Aguda. Now he doesn't do that. The Babacha was not Aguda. Why should you do that? The it's a whole art form in Israel, since you have this proportional representation, how you apportion the seats. Um, let's say, for example, you're a party that typically gets 10, 15 votes. So if I'm serious about wanting to include you, I'll put you somewhere in the 10 or 15. If I'm semi-serious about you, I'll put you 16, 17, you know. If I put you at 20, 25, you could be the devil. <laughs> you're, not, you're not getting there anyway. You know, they're never going to win 20. The Agud is not going to win 20 seats. You get it? Or the Likud party is not going to get, you know, if they put you at spot number 75, but that ain't just ain't happening, Jack. You see? So usually they got four. Maybe they get five, probably not. And so they put a Chabad guy for number five. Well, they did that figuring like this. Maybe Lubavitch should get out the vote. And they did. They didn't figure Lubavitch should get out the vote to put in another guy in. They thought it would at least solidify the four. To their surprise, they actually got a fifth guy in there. And this is now an interesting question. You know, a Chabad guy, is he a Haguda guy? Where does he take his headquarters? Where does he take his, his, his instructions from? You see? This will be very important in our story tonight. Now, uh, but in this election, uh, you know, the Rebbe said, vote Haguda. Uh, now, from now on, uh, until this past election, so notice, from 1980 to 2021, um, the Haredim were the king makers because of these numbers, okay? Because, and they got bigger later. So because it is, and in the BB coalitions and the, Arif, and the Sharon coalitions, um, they were the ones who make or break the government. If they support you, you have a majority. Without, you don't. Uh, and that gave them a lot of power and a lot of money. And that's why the black hat the sector in Israel has grown considerably from 1988 to today. What's that, 30 years? It's a long time. Uh, I hate to think it was a long time. Uh, and, and that's been of, of great importance. This has only changed because of a Victor Lieberman. Okay, that's, you know this. This is what happened in the last couple elections. They started the Ruski party for all these Soviet Jews who got no time for this black hat stuff. That's not who they are. They are against that. You know, you want to be religious, all that. don't pass no laws telling me what I can do, can't do, and about pork, and I don't want to hear that. Okay? And so... Um, Lieberman, I mean, I watched it in the last two or three elections. Remember, it took three elections to get where we are now. Do you remember that? The last year or two? It took three elections in Israel because each time they couldn't get, couldn't get a, uh, a majority. But four elections? Yeah, see, Michael's ahead of me. He is ahead of me. Uh, four elections to get it as a crazy, you see? And the reason is each time Bibi lined up enough votes, he just needed the Russian party. They said no. Okay. And that's because the Russian voters, they don't want this black hat stuff. They, don't, they just don't want it. And he triumphed because the current government doesn't have anybody from the black hat in the government. So as he got his way, you get it? And we're seeing the results of it as we speak. So this is the dynamic. But 1988 to 2020 is a long time. And the patterns that I'm talking about, which is the Haredim expanding the vote and being the kingmakers, all the rest of it, is what kept the Likud in power and gave them a tremendous amount of leverage. That's all I'm saying. Now, for Shamir, who was the head of the Likud, he f looks at the election numbers. Um, can we go back one? Oh, yeah, right. He looks at the election numbers, 
And he said like this, okay, I got 40. The magic number is 61. I got to get 21. So just take my word for it. If you put all the religious votes together, it's 18. You know, between the Aguna and the Shas and this, and it's 18. Okay, so that puts me at 58. It ain't 61, but it's close. Okay? Now, look at some of these little parties down there. I won't drive you crazy with it, but you get to Rats. Well, that's a left-wing party. Uh, Chada, that's a left-wing party. Oh, that's a right-wing party. That's three. I'm already home. I'm home. Right? I got 58 and three. I got 61. I'm not finished. Let's go down a little bit more. Uh, my palm, forget that. So my, oh, that's a right-wing party. There's another two. I got 63. That's very respectable. It's not by a paper. I'm not done. Let's go. What else we got? You got Moletta. That's General Zevi. Oh, that's a right-wing party also. It's, a, it's 65. You see what I'm saying? In other words, 65 is very respectable as a majority in the government. So Shamir could have done that. The only thing is, even he... With a, with a, he didn't feel comfortable with the <laughs> in other words, the fact that the black hat part is not going to really say we want double the money we got before and double that and double that and they can force it and he you know didn't mind being squeezed but not that much and it made him uncomfortable as a Zionist and therefore um, he said uh I mean, listen, from the point of view of the Haredim, you make hay when the sun shines. I mean, I, I understand why he did it. And so, um, let me put it this way. He said to the Labour Party, he said, it would be better if we go back to having a coalition. You understand? Like we did before. The religious parties will be part of it like it was before, but they won't have that power. You see? Now, he thought he's making an, an above-board deal which should be respected as an above-board deal. And just as we went through four years together until now, with our arguments, I mean, that's what a marriage is, you know. We'll go another four years, from 88 to 92, and we'll get the country through that. I might point out, I don't know if they knew at that time, 88 to 92 was going to see the beginning of the mass aliyah from Soviet Union. So suppose, for example, they didn't have the problem with their disagreements over the Arafat business. And they were just combined as two parties trying to solve the problem, then the klita of the Soviet Jew would have been much better. Do you see what I'm saying? If everybody would just be focused on getting the job done right, instead of each one trying to sabotage and backbite the other, then I think the absorption of the Soviet Jews would have been happier. But whatever, whatever the case is, the problem, of course, is it's an objective fact that the parties can switch anytime they want. So if you're a good or somebody like that, you can be a kingmaker and I can unmake you as well because we withdraw our support from the coalition. See, now, again, those right-wing parties I meant before, Tehia, uh, who is it, uh, Tomet, and these other things that come and go, uh, they're not going to join the left-wing government. That's not who they are. Their whole raison d'etre is that they're right-wingers. They very strongly oppose any concessions to Palestinians. The from parties, you can buy them either way. No, that's the problem. You can buy them either way. It's a matter of money. It's a sad re reaction. Now, so in other words, they are going to support Shamir as the prime minister um, if they get what they want, but they always have the possibility of changing their mind and supporting the other guy. And just take my word for it for now, as you'll see in a minute, that Paris can also do arithmetic like that. If you have 39 plus 18, it gives you 57, so you're only four away, you know what I mean? So you can play that way. You can find four seats from those left-wing groups. Uh, not more, but you can find four seats from the left-wing groups. So it's a funny kind of situation. The religious part of you go either way. Now, this couldn't happen under Begin. You understand? Let's go ahead. Because Malcolm Begin had a personal relationship, I would say, with the religious voters. And that's just who he was. I don't think they would have the possibility you know, to stab him in the back. Although, I'm sure politicians are capable of anything, and I say that with a straight face. But I don't think they would have been able to do it. But Shamir was not like that at all. You understand? Shamir was not this man. Okay? Look at the bottom. There's Begin reading the McGill next to the Rabbi Sher from the Aguda when he visited Washington, D.C. because it's a Purim. It's a Purim. Now, um, since Likud plus his block got 58, 
Shamir got the, uh, the, the nod, and as I told you before, he set up the government. Now, this was happening in November and December of 88. What else is happening in November, December of 88? Ronald Reagan administration out, George Bush administration coming in. Bush was elected, obviously, in the beginning of November of 88. That's the American elections, okay? So you're having a new switch of administrations in Washington. By this time, as the Reagan administration is departing and the Bush administration is coming in, I would say that the two-state solution had hardened into holy writ uh, in, the, in the political correctness. And everybody in the world, even if you're a supporter of Israel, you have to say you're in favor of a two-state solution. Because how are you going to justify the occupation of the West Bank? And doubting it was like doubting COVID. I'm talking about the American security elites, including the Reaganites, except for a couple of the neocons, and Kyle Bachomer, the incoming Bush administration. Right? So you have President Bush and Baker, James Baker, we made the Secretary of State, we'll talk about next week, and then General Scrocroft, who was the uh, National Security Advisor. And these guys are hardwired for a two-state solution. We're in favor of Israel, et cetera, et cetera, but the Palestinians got to get a state too. That's how it goes. Which, by the way, I want to be clear, under George Bush, it means the Palestinians get East Jerusalem. Let's be clear about that. Boy, did he blow up if Israel ever built something in East Jerusalem. He, I, mean, I, I want you to understand that. Now, um, Arafat was licking his chops. And for the first time in 20 years, he was within reach of his goal, which had always been to negotiate with Israel. You see, Arafat, ever since he started the PLO around 1960 or so, so in the early years, this young guy said, let's just attack Israel and wipe him out. But after a while, I'm pretty clear, you're not going to wipe him out. If you're not going to wipe him out, then what's the plan? You've got to negotiate some situation which you get a Palestinian state. Of course, to him, they'll use that eventually as a base to knock out Israel. So to understand what I'm talking about, just think of Gaza today. See, that's you know, what Arafat had in mind long term, like a Gaza situation, which is a cancer they, can't, they don't know what to do with. They don't know what to do with. So now... After this 1960s, 1970s, 1980s, Arafat was in, was in reach of his goal, which had always been negotiate with Israel. Arafat was already set back 10 years. I mean, if you know the Israeli history, and I tried to explain in the past, I don't know if anybody remembers, already in the late, seven, by 1977, the Labor Party was already ready to talk about a two-state solution. Unfortunately for them, Menachem Begin got elected, and that like threw everything out of whack. You understand? But they didn't figure on that, because you know the Labor Party always won. So they didn't figure on that. Now came the 1980s, 10 years later, and Arafat was aware that Shimon Peres would deal with him, even if he doesn't renounce the PLO charter, because Peres was like that. Notice the PLO charter, I think we all remember, said we believe in the destruction of Israel. Shimon Peres, this is his style of negotiating is, okay, fine, but let's talk Turkey, and by the time it's over, we'll work that out, you see? So in other words, his negotiating style was to make no demands on the other side, but just engage in the back and forth and hoping in the course of negotiations, these things will be worked out. That is, a, you know, I'm not a lawyer, but some lawyers have that style. Other lawyers were like Malcolm Begin. I want everything clearly set up before we go to the negotiating session. That's why, as we know, Begin drove everybody crazy, but Begin got what he wanted. Okay? He gave Egypt back to Sinai, he got a total free peace treaty, and he had no commitment in the treaty to make a, a Palestinian state. That's what he wanted. See? And, you know, like I said before, he drove everybody crazy, but he got what he wanted. So it's a different style. To Arafat's distress, now comes 1988, and instead of Paris winning the election, Shamir won the election, okay? And Shamir was going to be prime minister again. And they were anti-PLO, and they're anti-two-state solution, just as, as Menachem Begin had been. I mean, the prime minister and the foreign minister was a Shamir and Moshe Aaron's, if you remember, they see right through Arafat. I mean, they're not, they don't fall for that for a second, Okay. But the government did include, for example, the labor. Shimon Peres was the finance minister, which is a very important post. And Yitzhak Rabin, of course, was in charge of the military, defense minister. These are two very important posts. Um, maybe they can pressure Shamir now, now, to negotiate with Arafat. That's what the Israeli politics boils down if you strip away all the newspaper titles. This is the hardcore of it. In order to facilitate such a dramatic move, Arafat had to get the backing of the United States to pressure Israel, because no other country can pressure Israel, okay? The PLO was officially in the charter dedicated to destruction of Israel. So how can the USA push Israel to negotiate with the PLO? Israel always had the uh, option, and they use it all the time, saying, how can I, the guy wants to kill me. Why, why are you pressuring me to go and deal with him, okay? Well, the answer is renounce the goal. 
And so accept the two-state solution, which Arafat did right after the establishment of the Shamir government. You see? He, in other words, I need the United States now. Now, was Arafat full of bull? Yeah, of course. But as a ruthless opportunist, what's the difference? You know, say whatever it takes. What happened, therefore, was that the PLO, now that the Likud won, the PLO proclaimed the state of Palestine. You got a state of Israel, now you got a state of Palestine. Arafat was elected the president, naturally. As head of state, he gave a speech, and he declared officially in the speech, we now accept Israel's right to live in peace and security. They didn't change the charter, but this is good enough for the Bush administration, right? But as Bush now said, Israel now has no excuse not to negotiate with the PLO for a two-state solution. Now, I'm oversimplifying. They didn't say it exactly that way, but that's what it boiled down to. You know, they said you can negotiate with Jordan, but there should be Palestinians as part of the delegation, all that kind of stuff. But that's what it boiled down to. Uh, Shamir said, no, Arafat is lying. I know what he said. He's a liar. Shimon Peres, thanks a lot, said, no, he's not lying. You hear what I said? It's not that Shamir said he's lying and Bush said he's not lying. Your own guy, Shimon Peres, said it. Okay? As we shall see next week, I hope, the Bush administration focused like a laser on getting a two-state solution, a Palestinian state. Then they did it in a diplomatic way, trying to push Israel salami slice by salami slice to negotiate with the PLO, knowing full well that such a dialogue had to end in a, in a Palestinian state. As Martin Buber says, if you have a genuine dialogue, there's just certain things you accept as, as, as being part of the dialogue. If you and I have a talk, I just have to respect you. You see? And we're not leaving this without certain things happening. This is exactly why Shamir and these guys didn't want to negotiate with the PLO. Okay? Now, Paris, I hope I haven't lost you, dealt with the new secretary, said Baker, James Baker. He dealt with him secretly, behind the back of Shamir and Aaron's. So again, you have this crazy situation where everybody in my government should be on my team. That's how it works. You guys are your team, and my guys are mine. No, one of the biggest players on my team is stabbing the rest of the team in the back. That's how it goes. Encouraging Baker to turn up the heat on the Likud. The hope was that Shamir would either cave in, which would discredit him with his own voters, or else Shamir would defy America and lose support among the broad voters for alienating America. Either way, Shamir would fall, and Paris would become prime minister, and it's Yashikov to Machiavelli. You know what I'm now, when Shamir found out that Paris and company were scheming to undermine the government's policy, even though they couldn't get their way in the cabinet. In other words, they made their case, but Shamir and this, it made his case. So, because he could always be outvoted by the Likud, Shamir fired Paris and broke the coalition. That's what happened. He said, uh, you know, I'm not going to have a snake in my camp, right? At least the people on my side should be on my side. In reaction, Shimon Paris, who thought of this beforehand, with his new set of aides, he got all these young guys who were leftists, Yossi Balin, people like that, they set out to actively depose Shamir from becoming prime minister, and then Paris could become prime minister and negotiate a two-state solution with Arafat. Now, the basic plan would go like this. Um, we'll arrange a situation where you have a vote of no confidence. Israel, of course, is a parliamentary government. So if there's ever a vote of no confidence, if a majority of the people in the Knesset vote no confidence, the government falls. And what happens is you have a caretaker government. That's how it works until the next election, until a new government is, is set up. But this one is officially kaput. Uh, it's the same people stay in place, but you know now they're working on sending another government. So let's arrange that the Likud government should fall on a, on a vote of no confidence. The essence of the plan was to get the front parties behind anybody's back to be bribed, and then they'll surprise everybody and join the no confidence vote. It's a Machiavellian situation. And then Shimon Peres would form a government with the religious groups and with the left-wing parties, even though it's a little strange, but you know, all these guys need his money, and I'll just promise them the moon. I'll give you 10 times for your kolel what the other guy's giving you. We get it, you know, how do they say it with the mafia? I gave him an offer, he just couldn't turn down. See? In terms of parliamentary arithmetic, the plan required seducing the religious parties. So like I told you before, if he's got 39 and they're 18, so 319 gives you 57, and then come with some of the smaller groups. So, you know, just reverse the process. If I got 57, so let's go down the line. Rocks is five. Oh, I'm, I'm home. Right? I'm already home. 57 and five. You see? And, uh, you know, some of the other parties like that. Now, it wasn't so simple because not all the religious parties would go along. And therefore, he couldn't deliver the full 18 votes. But you can get from the other ones enough to make up for that, hopefully. 
All I can tell you is now it gets into what they in politics they call counting the noses. You know what I mean? Like who's who who's there? Um, and uh, how do you get the from to vote for you? Well, they fed the head of the of uh, the Shah's party was uh, this next guy, Ayyadari, who later went to jail, Mr. Sleaze, you know? And they basically said like this, you know, we'll give you a party double and we'll give you triple. <laughs> you understand? That's, that's how it works. That's how it works. You understand? Uh, it's a good thing Baltimore has honest politicians. And we, we didn't have anything like this in the state of Maryland. I've heard in other states such things happen. But, you know, anyhow, um, so first of all, he said, I guess this, I'll give you a lot more money. And Derry said like this, it's a deal. Why he did it is strange. I think they played up to him, played on his vanity. The guy was in his, in his early 30s. All these, you know, they invite him to Tel Aviv to all the uh, classy, high-scale parties. And people say, oh, you do this, you help the country. Shimon Paris, I understand totally. I don't blame him a bit. Shimon Paris said like this, in order to get, in my view, in his faith, Setting up a Palestinian state is the answer to all of Israel's problems. That's how he saw it. And this will solve everything in the Middle East. You know, let's say it was true. It wasn't true, but let's say it was true. And Israel will finally get peace. I mean, really, peace and security. So Ben-Gurion bribed the parties, you know, the religious parties to, to, to run and get things his way. It's, it's price of doing politics. Didn't Abraham Lincoln, you know, do all kind of horse trading to get the uh, anti-slavery amendment uh, passed? Right? You do, you do this as long as in, in the pursuit of a higher goal, you see? So it's just a matter of how much money you're talking about. Uh, so anyhow, um, Derry said like this, let me persuade my party. But his own uh, other Knesset members, they said, this is not right. Our voters didn't vote for this. We didn't vote to give away to Arafat. We're right-wingers, you know what I mean? This sort of thing. Um, Ari Derry said, like, so you shut up. I know what's better for you than you know. I know for our voters what's better than for the voters know. And Avati Yosef is behind this. Okay, that's what he said. He said, Avati Yosef is, is supporting me. So in other words, uh, they violated Abraham Lincoln's famous rule. <laughs> you know, right? Where you know, honest politicians, you buy him, you say bought. Or Simon Cameron said, anyway. Now, um, so basically went around to the other Knesset members from the Agoda, from the Degel Ator, this, that, and the other, and Shahs. He said, I guess we're talking money over here. And second of all, anyway, Shamir is alienating the United States. This is not good. <laughs> you know, we want a, a prime minister Israel should get along with America. That's the basic uh, our arguments over here. Okay? Uh, Paris will do the opposite. It'll get in tight with America. It'll be good for everybody. I don't think the second argument was the clincher. <laughs> I think the money was the clincher. Um, now, Derry puts all the ducks in a row, even though many of his own members disagree. The question is, can he deliver the votes? Or as we would say today, is there Stalinist discipline in the Haredi parties, right? If the central headquarters says to do this, you can do this. This is always the advantage of the communist parties. It's a, the leadership have a valuable tool for negotiation purposes. You understand? Whenever you had these left-wing parties, let me put it this way. On Monday, Stalin said, I'm a friend with Hitler. On Tuesday, said, I'm against Hitler. Wednesday, he said this. And they just went back and forth, you know, back and forth. In this country, the communists, they saw Hitler's bad, and then when Stalin made a deal, the same communist Jewish guys marched up and down Fifth Avenue, Hitler's good, and then later on, they were Hitler's bad. Well, it, it's good for Stalin. I, you know, I can, whatever I say, I'll the people behind me. So can the religious party have that kind of discipline? So if the Muetzes Gedolia Torah, this is a more recent picture, of the big rabbis in the Agoda, not the Degel Torah, it's the Hasidic, if they say do something, will the members of the Knesset really do it? Well, it turns out that the Aguda and the Degla Torah Shas weren't exactly like that. Okay? Uh, and not exactly like that. But let's get to the story, you'll see. Paris has all ducks in a row. He comes to the Knesset one day and he said like this, I'm submitting a no confidence motion in the government. Right? Well, Shamir figures like this, well, we have a majority, we'll beat it. To the shock of the public, the Haredi parties, you know, some of the guys couldn't stand in and they abstained, but the Haredi parties joined a no confidence motion. Okay? The government therefore falls. It's a big shock. Okay? They go, the government goes into caretaker mode, as I told you before. The president of the country has to consult with all the parties because that's the system. The leaders of all the parties recommend Paris. In other words, obviously Paris recommends itself, but the Aguda 
and the Degelator and the Shas, and all, they all recommend press plus the left-wing parties. That's the Israeli political system. Based on these recommendations and on the parliamentary arithmetic, what the numbers suggest, the president of the country, Chaim Herzog, says, well, I'm appointing Paris to try to put together a government. Everything seems to be going just right. The problem is that Paris and all his genius, a young age, do not really understand the Haredi world. Their misunderstandings destroyed his Machiavellian the uh, scheme because the Paris arithmetic was based on a bare majority of 61. I told you not all the people would go along. So they did their numbers, they counted their noses, and they came up with 61, which is good enough, okay? All you need, though, if you have 61, is one person to dissent, and that plays a sign role, and the whole thing will fall apart. Well, it boiled down to two persons. There were two kingmakers who had not been consulted in the Haredi world. Two kingmakers who had not been consulted. First of all, was the Lubavitcher Rebbe. <laughs> he was no fan of a two-state solution. Remember, he opposed Malcolm Begin when he gave back the Sinai. You get it? Yeah, he, he opposed at the Kissinger deals after the Yom Kippur War that they should pull back, you know, even from the Suez Canal. The Rebbe's like, guess you hold on to every inch and so on and so forth. So he is not going to support knocking out Shamir and Paris. Now, wait a minute. One of those five Agoda guys, I told you before, was actually Chabad, okay? Is Elias and Mizrahi, who's a Yemenite Jew, who's Lubavitcher. Isn't that interesting? Their family converted to Lubavitcher in the 1940s. It's an interesting business, right? Rabbi Yaakov Mizrahi, he's well known in certain circles. You know, way back when in the 40s. Okay, fine. So let me put it this way. I don't take no orders from West Gedalia Torah. I get my orders from 770 Eastern Parkway. Thank you very much. You understand? Now, the Aguda politicians flew to New York, and they go to see the Baba Sarebi, and they say, you know, it's all planned. We'll get money, and this and that and the other. And anyway, we have a united religious block over here. And he said, like this, he said, I got a Tanakh over here, Bible. I don't see no words about United Religious Block, but I do see Eretz Yisrael in here, so you guys can take a flying hike, you know? So, because they were dealing with the wrong guy over there. Now, um, there was another guy also, whose name was Avram Verdiger, who was not a Lubavitcher, but he was from the Poli Aguda, and he was an IDF veteran. You get it? And as such, he said, I can't go along with this stuff. I mean, I served in the front lines. You can't give all the whole West Bank back to the Arabs, that's crazy. You understand? In other words, I don't care about the money. It's interesting. There are two people saying, money's, money's important, but it's not everything. There's something more important than money. Now, in the Lubavitch case, the Rebbe is more important money. I get that. And for the Lubavitch Rebbe, the money, there's no point, you know, compared to Israel. It's Israel Ashlema. But this guy, just on himself, he did it. The Aguda was going to blast this guy for not holding the party discipline, but then the other shoe dropped. Because it turned out, not only had they failed to consult the Lubavitcher Rebbe, but they also failed to consult his nemesis, Rav Shach, okay, who was the leader of the Litvaks. He had not been consulted, and he hates Paris and the left because they're the ones who did Saul Shabbati. They're the ones who made everybody unfrom back in the early 50s, and they kidnapped the Yemenite babies, and, all that, and he has a long memory because he's almost 100 years old, and he has a long memory. He's like, yes, we are not deposing Shamir to put this guy in, and... He gave a, made a famous speech, I'll hope to deal with that later this year, in Stelio, where he basically said like this, we, uh, I'll spare you the details, we are not voting for these Trefeniks, and that killed the whole plan, because the Agoda can't go after anybody who didn't vote. Rav Shach came out and said, anybody who supports something like this is unprincipled. In other words, let's put it this way, I don't care about the money. Right? Because he was looking at double and triple the money. So, this, uh, I would say this, Paris and his guys were a little too cynical. Now, I don't bl blame them. When you deal with these politicians in Knesset, it's a sleazeball situation. That's what politicians are. It's all sleaze. But at least it's nice to know behind them is somebody, it's not some people. Now, you can agree with their politics. You can disagree with their politics. But it's nice to know that some people, it's not all about money. Malcolm Bacon was like that, right? It's not all about money. To many people, it is. So it was a very interesting kind of phenomenon. Uh, remember, at this time, Rav Shach was still running the Shas together with Avad Yosef in, in, in that particular period of time. So that killed the whole business because the front politicians were unable to deliver their own votes. They ended up with egg all over their face, right? For Shimon Peres, it was a deep humiliation because he was in the car with his wife, driving to the Knesset, about to come in, and 
you know, rock. He's going to come in and have 61 seats. And he learns in the car, listening to the radio, that Lubavitcher just killed the deal. And it's like, uh, you know. So it's a, if you ever read the Paris biographies, it's one of the moments of extreme uh, humiliation. Okay? It solidified the image of Shimon Paris, who was a capable guy, but it solidified him as number one, an unprincipled intriguer, right? And number two, a loser. So that's so much so, because it didn't even work, you know? It's a pretty sneaky deal. But let's say he pulled it off. How he pulled it off? Couldn't even pull it off. And there's a famous speech that Paris gives 10 years later at the labor convention where they're booing him. He said, Ma, any loser, honey? And he said, Okay, you know, right? Uh, which he wasn't really, but nevertheless, let me put it this way. In electoral politics, the guy had a, a schlem mazel. So I can tell you. And that to make things even worse, his nemesis in the Labor Party is Isaac Rabin. They have no love lost between them. And he gave, and they asked him what the Israeli pre, uh, um, the radio station, what do you think about this? He said, the whole thing was a Targil Masriach. It says, entered Israeli lexicon, a dirty trick, a, a smelly uh, exercise. Fashtunken, you would say in Yiddish, Masriach, you know? Well, Fashtunken Enterprise. This is now part, you can go, if you go online and you do, and Google, uh, Targil Masriach, you get the whole story. It's, what I'm trying to say, it became part of the lexicon. And maybe even Dirty Trick Israel, something like that. It became part of the, so Paris became, you know, <laughs> identified with the Targil Masriach, which is why in the next election, Robin was the prime minister in 92. Get it? You know, uh, <laughs> Paris uh, killed himself. Now, comes the anticlimax. Now that this is all over, they got to go back to Shamir, who has to be nice. You know what I mean? What's he going to say? I, don't, I still need you. He said, let's pretend nothing happened. And let's set up a government of 65, like we said before. The Likud, the right-wing parties, and the religious parties, and that's a Hamish coalition. Okay? Now that at least we're not going to stab each other in the back. We will have the problem of being opposed by a large labor party and the left, and that's going to be a big problem for Israel in the next four years dealing with the Bush administration because, you know, your own worst enemies are in your own house, uh, but at least at the cabinet table, we all feel the same way. What's going to happen with this American pressure that's going to build up for a two-state solution? That, my friends, is for next time. Good night.